Hi, this is Andrea Powell with Surviving Now, a production of Corona Rising. Thank you for joining us. We have a very interesting discussion today, looking at the way university scams are stealing the dreams of many vulnerable students. So we have here today, Kiana, who is going to be speaking from lived experience as a student, as a survivor, as a mom, as a superhero, uh, and all kinds of other amazing things. And we have here also Alex, uh, who is senior counsel with the uh, Student Defense Fund. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a moment, but uh, for those of you who have not joined us before Surviving Now, Surviving Now is a production of Corona Rising. We are survivors, uh, for survivors, by survivors. And the intent behind this conversation is to really level the playing field where we have individuals with lived experience on our team and through our network of survivors who can talk about the day-to-day -day issues that are impacting us on a broader societal level. And we're often joined then by experts on specific topics that are emerging and, and pressing for us as a community. So that being said, uh, Kiana, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Well, my name is Kiana. I'm originally from Washington, D.C., born and raised. I moved around a bit, and I have currently um, moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Um, hey, Kiana. I'm in the middle of the year. There's a bit of a, a feedback noise. There we go. Now it's fine. Okay. All right. You know what, Alex? Why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself while Ka Kiana takes a moment? Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, technical glitches are becoming a reality right now for all of us. So. Yes, as are screaming kids in the background, which may or may not happen in a little bit. <laughs> um, but no, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Alex Elson. I'm senior counsel and co-founder of the National Student Legal Defense Network, uh, Student Defense for short. And we are a fairly new organization. We've been around since early 2018. Um, we provide legal services to student loan borrowers mostly who have been either defrauded by predatory institutions or uh, have other, otherwise have uh, student, student debt issues. Um, much of what we do involves um, litigation. It involves litigation against the United States Department of Education and, and it involves litigation against schools that have essentially lied to students um, about the services they're provided, about the job prospects that they might get upon graduation and the like. We also do policy work and advocacy um, around student issues. So not everything is litigation, but we are a team of lawyers mostly. Uh, and our focus on, in, on getting, getting to positive change has been in this, kind, in this climate mostly through, uh, through lawsuits. Okay, thanks. Um, so I happen to, to know uh, that you went from corporate law to, to government to nonprofit law. Uh, so an upward spike probably in job satisfaction, perhaps a downward spike in other aspects of the job. Uh, but I'd love to hear a little bit like what inspired you to, to join the team that you're on? Well, it's a good question. And yes, the accurate characterization. Um, <laughs> I've always wanted to do work in education law, civil rights law. Um, I didn't actually know much about higher education law until I took a job with the Department of Education in the previous administration um, and a little bit into this administration working on specifically student debt relief issues uh, under a provision of the law that was not known too well before 2015, which is the borrower defense to repayment provision, which essentially will allow students to apply for debt relief on the basis of misrepresentations, misconduct, violations of state law by the school. Uh, and the department, starting in 2015, started to receive a lot of applications for such relief because one very large predatory for-profit school had collapsed, known as Corinthian Colleges. People may have heard of them. Um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of applications over time started to come. And the department had to create a system and more robust regulations in order to deal with the claims for debt relief. And there were problems that were really industry-wide that were not just this one school, but schools across the country that were essentially scamming people, <laughs> that, were, that were providing false representations about what, what, what they were offering to students. And so I did that work. And once I started to do that work, I realized that this was a serious problem and that there is just millions and millions of dollars that are on the line here for students across the country. Uh, and that this uh, was an issue that harmed a lot of people 
Um, and so when the current administration stopped providing that relief or really froze the program, um, I ended up uh, leaving and have joined this new organization now where we're fighting for students' rights. Awesome. That's a really good, concise overview. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for the, the work that you do, um, particularly since, you know, as someone who's worked with uh, individuals who've experienced a variety of, of exploitation and trafficking and abuse, uh, going back to school is, is really a dream um, and a necessity really to thrive for many people. Um, and, and I've seen you know, various degrees of, of interest in education and success, but there, there certainly are a lot of barriers. And as you and I have discussed, um, you know, situations in which people who've already been exploited, like survivors of trafficking, are then subsequently re-exploited or victimized through fraudulent scams, either through a university or a loan system. So, you know, this is just a conversation that you and I've been having for a while. So I'm happy to bring it to light. Um, Kiana, I'm gonna unmute you now so that you can introduce yourself again. So take it from the top, sister. All right. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. There we go. I had it connected. Um, well, my name is. Thank you. My name is Kiada. I'm originally from Washington, D.C. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia about a year and a half ago. Um, I was actually just visiting and ended up liking it. So I decided to stay, stay with my aunt for a little while. And I have now managed to get my own place, a really good job. And I'm hoping to go back to school. Um, one of my barriers has been I've had a child. Um, he is now two years old. Um, it's okay that it's a barrier because it's no time limit on when you can go back to school, but I do plan on going back. So that's a little nice. bit about me. Thank you, Kiana. And I am a survivor. So Yes, and you, uh, I'm just going to like tease this out of you, but you've done a bit of advocacy uh, work as well, you know, mm -hmm as your pathway toward to where you're at today. So if you want to share anything about that, we'd love to hear it. Well, those opportunities were really amazing. I feel like that made me the person that I am. Um, during my teenage years, it was like I was so headstrong and attitude and so mean and so upset at the world. And then once I met with you guys, it just changed me into a different person. It made me realize like there's more out of life. Um, and then there are people that will support you even if your family does not. And so me advocating, it was for to help girls that were in the same situation as I was that did not have nobody there, that did not have the support. So I really liked it. And hopefully if they have some opportunities in Georgia, I might take it on. But for now, I'm just getting back. I'm getting back. Well, I can certainly hook you up with groups down in, in Georgia. Thank you. Uh, Thank so we'll you. talk about that a little bit later. Um, Alex, let's just kind of dive in a little bit. Um, do you think that there are more vulnerable people now, say a year ago at this time, toward the types of, of fraud and exploitation that you're seeing through your work? Good question. I just want to start by saying that none of what we talk about should be taken to discourage future education. Uh, education is, a, is, a, is generally a very good thing, and you know, I don't want to chill anyone's desire and excitement to take that on. And there are, in every single part of the country, very good schools, community colleges, higher ed institute problems that provide excellent, excellent uh, education. And so I want to start there. Um, but there are red flags, and unfortunately, in our society, we often will think, we don't think of colleges like car salesmen, but there are some colleges that operate like that. And it's important to have your guard up and be aware that just because it's a college, it doesn't necessarily mean it's trustworthy. So we're going to talk, I think, later about some things to look for. But to Andrea's question right now, it is, uh, it is a time to be especially cautious because a lot of people are now unemployed. People are at home, they have time on their hands. And uh, it is a time when historically, think, obviously we haven't had a situation like this, but for example, in the last recession, when, when there was widespread unemployment, there was also an uptick in predatory behavior from colleges because they see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to bring in more, more students, more dollars, and especially with more online education now, uh, it's just, it is easier money, um, and it's easier to bring students in with federal student loan money uh, to support, and it's, 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 it, it, is, it is important now to be more cautious because 
if, if those trends from what we've seen before continue now that we have massive unemployment, there, there is going to be a push, I think, in targeted advertising and in, and in efforts to, to bring more students in, potentially with products that aren't that good, with education that isn't that good. Awesome. No, that's, that's a good kind of historical snapshot and, and very helpful. Um, you know, Kiana, I, I know that, you know, you've had various experiences in your educational journey, but can you share a little bit for those who are listening about your own educational background and you know, what were some potentially some barriers um, and what are some things that you enjoyed? Yeah, so when I first started college, I was actually homeless, staying at this um, shelter called Covenant House in Washington, D.C. So that was one barrier was that my main thing was trying to figure out where was I going to live. Um, really didn't have family support, but with my case manager's help, she got me into UDC Community College, which I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Um, and when I first signed up, it was like, it went by like a breeze. I passed through with A's when I very first started and it just pushed me to continue to keep going because I knew it was something I needed. But every semester, of course, I'm constantly looking for somewhere to live. And it was just like, that was always like heart sinking to me because I did not have nowhere to go, but I made sure education was my main thing. Um, then another barrier that I had was financial. Um, I did get federal student loans, but then I also ended up getting unsubsidized and subsidized loans, which I did not know any information about. My um, advisor never like talked me through it. I didn't have the background knowledge of the loans. And it was like every year I'm just taking out money, taking out money, not realizing I have to pay that back. Um, so now it's kind of like, had they would have walked me through it, I would have understood what I was doing and I would have said, okay, no, I don't want that loan, I'll take this one. And so it was kind of like, but now that I know more about it, I know, okay, next time that I go back to school, which loans to take out, with the, what not to do, um, as far as the grants and everything, I have looked into that as well. I have looked into scholarships, so I've been looking into things so that it, it will not affect me later down in line. Because now I have student debt that I shouldn't even have right now because I don't even have a degree. So it's like I've already accumulated debt from that because I did not know any information on it. So that was another barrier. And then my last barrier was, of course, was when I got pregnant. And that kind of just put a hold on things. And I needed to make sure that me and my son were in a stable environment. And hence the reason my very first apartment. So I'm proud of myself seven years and I finally got it so well I Kiana I commend you because you know speaking candidly to those barriers one is 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 a very hard opening experience and so I, I appreciate you sharing that and I, I think it's important for people to destigmatize uh, and this is part of the goal of the show but to destigmatize experiences like like having debt or you know trying because I think what I hear from you is you know you're really out there pushing yourself to, to get that degree, to have a better life for you and your son. And it's a beautiful thing, um, but a lot of people struggle with how to, to communicate about those challenges as they're trying to, to overcome them and go back to school. Um, yeah. Alex, I, uh, I think I, I was gonna save this question because it's maybe my favorite question for you, but I'm, I'm going in, I'm really feeling it, um, which is you know, what are some red flags that that people might want to look for when they're thinking about going back to school because you're absolutely right that is a beautiful and amazing thing and if i could afford it i would probably be a perpetual student uh so so i understand the passion and the dream but um what are some red flags and some tactics that that exploitative universities might take on that that people like kiana or others might want to hear about that's a great question it comes in many forms but uh I think the first thing to think about when you are deciding whether or not to attend a school is, A, how did you hear about that school in the first place? Uh, where, were, where were they advertising? Um, and, and what did that advertising feel like? If it does feel like you are trying to be sold a car, it's, it is probably, it's, it is a red flag. There, there shouldn't be, in examples, what I mean by that, um, you know, you should, when you are enrolling in a, in a school, it's a huge life decision. Uh, and it's your decision. And you're, you're the customer, you, you have the power um, to decide whether or not to go. And if you are being pushed, pressured, 
if you don't sign up by the end of the day today, you're going to miss your opportunity, all that kind of stuff, like buy this car right now. Uh, that, that's just not how a college should be acting, but it is how a lot of the more predatory schools behave. They want you signed up immediately or you're going to walk. They know that that is big money for them as soon as you enroll. And so they're going to get you. And then this is how they train their staff to sign on the dotted line, like the day that you walk in for a tour or they, if they, so if there's any pressure for, uh, on you to act quickly, that's, that's a red flag. And just don't do it. Go home, research, take a step back. It's a, it's a very big decision. You don't want to be rushed into doing it. So I actually pressure, want to speak on that. Because I had a situation like that um, right when I was pregnant, right before I even knew that I was pregnant. I was um, actually researching different schools. I don't want to say the name of the school, but it is a well-known school. It's a technical um, college. And they did have a nursing degree and social work degree, psychology. So I was like, oh, this is good because it's kind of like the field that I want to be in. I'm looking into psychology. I'm looking into social work. And I went in there and it was like, he was just trying to sell it to me and sell it to me. And I'm like, uh, yeah, it didn't sit right with me. So of course I, I was like, I would talk to my case manager and I would let her know, hey, something don't feel right. And she was like, well, if you don't feel comfortable with it, don't go through with it. So I was like, okay. So I went, I went there the next day and it was like, he was saying, well, we have until next Friday. Let me know what you decide or we're gonna have to move and go on to another candidate. And I was like, well, schools don't work like that. Like I've been in school. Once I went through the financial aid and he told me to fill out the information, I did the FAFSA and everything. And that was when it showed that I would end up in turn having to pay them on top of the financial aid coming in. I said, no, I, I just, something, did, it didn't sit right with me. And so I never took that opportunity, but I know that is good information because it could, it's people in that school, so people fail for it. And it puts you in more and more debt because you're not realizing, okay, they're trying to sell you this school for a reason. And that's what the guy was doing. And I, I didn't take it. And then two weeks later, I found that I was pregnant. But, I mean, good, good on you because it's an intimidating situation. And it's important to recognize that because they have all, all the information and you, like student loans are very complicated. Like financial products are very complicated. If, if you don't have a lot of experience with them, they're even more complicated. Um, and there, if you, but, but you need to understand it. It's important to understand it. And so to slow down. And if the responses to your questions are, don't worry about it, or we'll take care of that once you're signed up, or, you know, the federal government backs this. And so it's obvious, we're obviously good. Like if that, none of that is true. And so, you know, you need to, it's very important that you understand it and that you take the time to, and that you ask the, the questions to make sure that like you are getting the answers that you need and not just trusting. Because if it is an environment where it is moving very quickly and they're pressuring, pressuring, and they're saying, don't worry about the financial stuff, like that is exactly what you need to be worried about in that circumstance. And so again, my advice is to slow down, make sure you understand everything, talk to other people. You don't need to sign up that day. You can take the time to do that. Um, other things to indicate, you know, before you're in that situation, just to look at, it's good to know if the school is a for-profit college or not, because m the vast majority of these types of behaviors happen in the context of for-profit colleges. Not all of them, and that's not, a, you know, that, that, that's not a, a golden rule or a hard and fast rule, but it will give you a sense. If the school is for-profit, uh, you know, there are incentives to make as much money as possible for the profit of the owners. So. What people are often confused of what is, how do I know, is it for-profit, is private for-profit? Answer to that is no. You should look and see there are nonprofit institutions, there are um, public institutions, right? And there, but there are also private institutions which are non-for-profit. And then there are for-profit colleges. And you know, a simple way to look at it is just look, look them up on Wikipedia, do a Google search, you know, is, is X school for-profit? Like it, it should come up, you should see, you should get to learn, you can, as everybody knows, you can learn a lot from a Google search. Um, and when you search for the school, I would look at its Wikipedia page. I'd look at Facebook pages from students. When schools are, when students have complaints about bad schools, they usually have a Facebook group or some complaints on Facebook and you'll see it. I would look at the Better Business Bureau. If you, look, if you Google that, the people's complaints about schools. And if you're seeing a lot of complaints online, 
it's a major red flag. It means people have had really bad experiences. Um, and if the good statements online seem too good to be true, they were probably put there. <laughs> um, and so you can kind of get a sense for what's honest and what's not about what is out there on Facebook, Better Business Bureau, Wikipedia, just Googling to get a lay of the land rather than just taking the word for it. And, and, and also where the advertising appears. If it's you know, high pressure, if it's on, for example, daytime television, where they're just like, you got to enroll here now to get a better life. If you don't, you're going to be screwed. Like that's usually not your local community college doing that. That's usually someone that's trying to make money off of you. So be careful. Think about all those things as indicators and red flags. And you know, your judgment, your gut will go a long way <laughs> in, in telling you, is this person trying to pull a fast one on me? Or are they really looking out for my best interest? Yeah, that's super helpful information, Alex. Um, you know, I think if Kiana also just, it's, it's great that you followed your instincts. And I think, you know, that's what you did and is what Alex is advising. And I appreciate, you know, learning about some of those strategies to evaluate uh, a university, you know, as you and I discussed uh, recently in my field, if I, if I hear about, you know, a young person reaching out and saying, I'm thinking about taking this job or I'm thinking about, you know, getting involved with this person who's offering me all these opportunities. Uh, a couple of things usually come to mind. And one is, does it sound too good to be true? Um, and, and, and your instincts can kind of help you guide that. But at the same time, um, you know, what I think is, is good to, to realize is that, you know, even in, in exploitative relationships, be it through an institution or a company or, or through an individual, someone posing as a romantic partner, for example, it may be that even the 5% the, the chance that your gut is wrong and this person has the best interest or this is going to be this great opportunity, it may be that that 5% is better than what you feel is a 0% uh, opportunity that you're facing right now. And so sometimes you're, you're picking between different, different situations that don't feel good either which way. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's, that's something that's really challenging. And so it's never, you know, this conversation is certainly not meant to judge anyone who's, who's been in that position where they're trying to figure out, well, I wanted to try that, or maybe I kind of had a feeling, but I wasn't sure. Uh, so Alex, uh, what would be some recourses for students who maybe feel like they've been pressured into loans that, that. Uh, didn't serve them or were fraudulent or were put in a position where they thought they were going to get a degree or were promised even in some cases a job after they graduated and that didn't happen. What would be some recourses for them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. And, and, and you're right. It's, be, it's nothing to feel bad about if it's happened because it is an extremely complicated situation and it's a high pressure situation and it, it works. You're not alone. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of people have, are, are, are in that situation, potentially more than that. So um, if, if, if you find yourself feeling like you have been lied to and you took out student loans on the basis of things that turned out to be not true, if you wouldn't have done it otherwise, those types of things. Um, you know, there are, there are some options available. Um, you can file what we talked, what's known as a borrower defense claim. I mentioned it at the beginning with the Department of Education. Uh, right now, there are, it's essentially borrower defense program is a bit of a political football. Um, the Dep this Department of Education has been uh, very reticent to implement the program and has gone to extremes to limit the types of relief available, just giving people's partial discharges. Um, a lot of that is tied up in litigation right now um, and could change, but that is right now the, if you have federal student loans, that is, that is one option where you would go onto the Department of Education's website and search for borrower defense and find an application form and information about um, how to file such an application. Um, you know, your state attorney general also, they can't provide relief on your federal student loans, but they are generally very sort of, it is good to inform them of complaints and they have complaint systems. Um, and, you know, they, many state attorneys general have paid very close attention to these issues. Um, and if you've experienced that, it is very, it is a very good thing to do, I think, to inform, um, to inform their offices of, of your experiences and of the school. So that's on their radar. Um, organizations like ours, there are many, there, are, there aren't enough organizations that help students, but there, but there are, there are, there are becoming more and more. 
Um, so, you know, if you have a story, you you know, send, send, you can let us know as well. We're uh, info at uh, defendstudents.org. Um, and, you know, we can't take on every case. We do mostly larger uh, class action type of cases, but, um, you know, we will, we will look at, we look at everything that comes in uh, and, and would love to hear if, if, uh, if people have had really bad experiences with being lied to by schools. Um, and, and I think it's just also helpful to talk to other students who, who enrolled, not as a way to get anything, but as a way to kind of, you know, there, there is some power in solidarity. And when students come together, uh, it, it, can be, it can be an important um, organizing tool. I think that's really, you know, helpful that, especially that last comment of, you know, students coming together and, and having an opportunity to create that network of support. So, um, you know, you and I were in a conversation with a, another team member and survivor I know a while back and, um, you know, what started out as a, hey, I have this colleague of mine, a survivor who I care a lot about, who has a couple of concerns about a, a, a you know, a school that she's attending. Uh, through the course of that conversation, we unearthed what were definitely more than a couple of concerns. Uh, and, and, you know, what impressed me was, you know, later on, you know, taking this to some, some government authorities and realizing how interested they were and how serious they were taking those claims, but also as the, as the conversation unfolded, uh, more and more students um, actually came forward to, to me talking about what they'd experienced that were similar to, to this young woman who I knew. And it really struck me on a couple of levels. And, and one is that I wondered what it would have been like if there had been more opportunity for them all to talk, but there had been a, a climate of fear at that college uh, that prohibited that. And then the other was, to be honest, I was just pissed off. <laughs> I mean, that someone exploited someone who's already survived and been through so much. And, um, and so I, I kind of looked at the, I started thinking about recruitment tactics um, and, and what that looks like. You know, it's not just like the car salesman, but like, where are they recruiting? Are they recruiting at a, at a youth detention facility, at a, at a, you know, a disability checks, per, you know, location or places where there's people who are obviously struggling and, and trying to, to thrive. Uh, so that that's something I, I you know came to mind as as you were talking, um, Kiana. I you know I I love hearing about your interest in in psychology and social work because well you know it's like my jam. But um, but I, I want to hear a little bit more because I know I know you're thinking of going back to school and I want to hear like you know what are your dreams in the next couple of years and and how would school kind of play into that. Well, right now, I am currently a teacher and assistant director at a daycare. Um, I really like it, but my dream has always been social work, psychology, um, just kind of in that field. I haven't really like gotten down to the bottom of exactly where I want to be working, but I know somewhere in that field, I'm, I'm willing to try everything out. Um, advocacy has always been a big part. Um, because I like it so much and so I've been told it, it's a few places that I could apply to and look into um, but I, I have not like set a goal as of yet to where but I do want to continue going in that direction um, and getting my degree in that I actually found out that I was almost finished I would have had my I would have had my associates had I would have not left school and wow. even though an associate, it, it would have took me two years, and it's the very first step that would have got me a step somewhere closer into my field. But now it's like I don't really have nothing to speak for the knowledge that I have, other than the fact that I was 37 credits short. Well, I have 37 credits, and I was almost finished. So, but wow. as I go back, it'll be a breeze to go ahead and get that associate's and then go forward. I think that's a that's a good attitude to have. Uh, and Kiana, if it makes you feel any better, I have a few classes I took that did not count toward my degree and didn't realize that, but still had a lot of fun in that Japanese psychology class. And it's uh, great because <laughs> all, of, all, of, all of my classes can go. Like I looked into oh, it, I think transfer to Georgia and everything, and I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> because I needed it because I was like, I was so hesitant on moving down here. And not being able to go back, but then it was like, okay, my aunt, um, she's been a very big support system since I've been down here. 
And she told me, okay, create yourself a goal list on what you need to do to get back into school. And so I'm looking, I'm looking, and I'm like, well, he just told me I was almost done. I only needed three more classes. A science, a lab, and a foreign language, and I wasn't done. I said, are you serious? I said, I, I feel like I should have went back, but it's okay. Well, uh, child out of the process. Time to go back. <laughs> I see you have some... Uh, some young dreamers down down next to you who are yes, going to be I do. I'm, I'm babysitting right now. Well, you are a multitasker, advocacy, I'm trying to be in, babysitting, yeah. daycare. Because I, I understand what's going on during this pandemic. Most people can't work. Like I'm one of them working at the school um, down here in Georgia. It is a lot of places that are opening up, but the um, the schools they won't be opening up for the rest of the school year. So unfortunately, I'm out of work until then. Um, so I took on babysitting, you know, to have some income. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm going to, Kian, I'm going to give you a moment to, to chill because I see you've got a sidekick on the loose. But uh, Alex, I, uh, I thought now might be a good time to, to ask you, um, how have you seen the pandemic, you know, in addition to just saying there's more individuals who are potentially thinking of going back to school, but are there other ways that the pandemic have impacted existing or previous students as they're trying to you know survive either currently in school or perhaps with their loans and what they're experiencing right now yeah there there, there certainly is we're actually what's been taking up most of my time the past few weeks is a new lawsuit that our organization filed uh against the department of education um because of the pandemic uh congress passed a law which most of us are probably familiar with called the cares act which has a lot of provisions. It's what the stimulus checks came out of. Um, one thing that it requires is for the Department of Education to immediately stop garnishing the wages of borrowers who are in default on their student loans. So the Department of Education has extraordinary power. If, you, if you've defaulted on your student loans, uh, they, can, they can do multiple things. They can, they can offset your percent of your wages. Um, without getting a court approval to do so. Uh, and so they had, I think, garnished around $840 million, maybe more than that, of wages in fiscal year 2019. Um, so it's a lot of money and it's a lot of people. Uh, and the CARES Act says you need to stop doing that right now. This is an extraordinary time. This is emer it's emergency time. And anyone who is lucky enough to still have a job uh, needs every penny that they're earning in order to just get through this. And so until the end of September, all wage garnishment uh, was suspended. Um, but our organization continued to hear from people whose wages were still being garnished, and, and so did other organizations. Uh, and so we filed a, a lawsuit recently um, on their behalf requiring, or you know, the, the point of the lawsuit is to get the Department of Education to follow the law and to stop garnishing wages. And we learned just a few days ago in their first court filing in the case that there are still 54,000 people whose wages are being garnished. Um, and so it's still a massive problem. They don't have it under control. They're not in uh, compliance with the CARES Act. And so we are fighting for those borrowers to get immediate relief from these wage garnishments and to get refunded as quickly as possible for these payments. I mean, the magnitude of, of that problem and, and you know, the types of, uh, again, I mean, it comes back to, you know, who is this most deeply impacting? Because some listeners right now might hear, oh, it's $60, you know, here and $100 there, and it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you're on a tight budget, that $100 might be your food for the week, but $60 might be that phone bill for that phone that you need so that you can apply to other jobs while you're unemployed. So, um, you know, I think on, on behalf of, of, of everyone who I work with and, and work for, uh, in, in the space of anti-trafficking. I appreciate, you know, what you're doing and have consistently been surprised at the unusual ways in which our uh, work seems to overlap. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I really never, never thought that, that my work in working with survivors of trafficking would, would come into play and in, in thinking about issues around student debt and, and student scams. But again, you know, as, as we continue to talk and I talk to Kiana and others who are trying to go back to school or have had difficult situations, seeing again and again that it's so important to have, one, the information to understand how to evaluate um, 
you know, universities, but also loans. Um, and there are a variety of, of pretty good free online programs and, and places you can call to get a better understanding of whether a loan is a good fit. Um, either because, you know, some loans can be fraudulent, but it's also a matter of like trying to understand if you can actually pay that back. So I've heard of situations where you have particularly young people who are getting very large loans and those young people are either experiencing homelessness or they, they basically don't have a, a, a job at that time. And so it's, it's a pretty risky move um, to, to take on that big loan. But again, you know, it's no fault on them. They're, they're trying to get by and trying to do the best they can. But the more information that we have, um, the better. I, so I wanted to get ready to, to, to close out because I've learned that people don't listen for longer than about 40 minutes to a podcast. <laughs> um, so uh, that being said, I wanted to make sure that two of you didn't have anything else that you wanted to add either to plug some, your organization, Alex, or Kiana, anything you wanted to share? No? Okay, then the final thing we're going to do uh, is, again, this is Andrea Powell with Corona Rising, uh, and this is Surviving Now. But uh, before we close, we have a special birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday, Alex. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. I forgot. <laughs> oh, you forgot your birthday? <laughs> no, I didn't forget, but I did for the, for, I haven't been thinking about it for a while. Well, but good yes, thank you <laughs> eating a cupcake. I can give you a cupcake for fun. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, much thank appreciated. You, Alex. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, this has just been like such a such a great experience with all of you. And uh, I will make sure that we put up some resources on our YouTube page and our podcast channel as well. Uh, so for those of you who are listening, please check out those resources. If you yourself need support uh, for your educational journey, uh, or if you know someone who might need that information, uh, or if you want to learn more ways to get involved with Prana Rising, we are by survivors for survivors. Have a lovely rest of your Wednesday. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.